So we are wanting to have this last conversation because um, I think also what um, I think the last question, in fact, was uh, or the second last question from um, from this previous panel. Um, I mean, our politicians, elected politicians, in fact, are answering to those demands of the commoners, and how can we how can we make it reality? This is a question that was addressed to the municipality to to to, to representatives of of uh, municipalities, but how are we dealing with that on a European level? I mean, do we have political forces in Europe that can actually bring forward those ideas um, also on the transnational level? European Alternatives has been an org is a civil society organization, but that has been thinking about this topic for many years. And, um, and one of the questions that we posed ourselves is, do we need maybe a, a transnational political party to bring those demands forward? And we have um, in 2019, the next European elections, as you know, that uh, many of us will be taking part in. So what is the offer that uh, we will see in 2019? So this is one of the questions that I would like to invite Lorenzo Massilli and Miguel Oban to discuss. Miguel Oban is a deputy of Podemos in the European Parliament in Brussels. So. Um, from Podemos, obviously also a, a fairly, still fairly new party, and Lorenzo Massilli is one of the founders of European Alternatives and my colleague, so uh, thank you for having those last closing words, and um, please come on stage with me. Good. We have a bit of a conversation, a charla con Miguel. No, not un mm. uh, interventions. So we'll try to keep it quick and fast, uh, and then open it up and free and furious, should I say? And then we open it up also for a couple of questions, interventions, and we take the discussion over to the buffet and to the wine. Uh, I will speak in English and Miguel will speak in Spanish. Uh, así que tenemos los dos idiomas de esta sala cubiertos. Um, well, look, Miguel, I'm very happy to be uh, speaking about 2019 with you. And uh, we've done this previously because Podemos was uh, a ray of hope in the political imagination of many people, not only in Spain, but uh, across Europe. The idea that it is possible to do politics otherwise and that crazy ambitions and crazy visions coming from the grassroots, coming from civic activism can, can transform into real political force and can transform politics is an extraordinary uh, example that I think resonates across, uh, across Europe. Uh, what uh, I think I, I, I want to ask you is that precisely uh, to demand of you is that precisely this ambition and this vision, we take it over onto the next political appointment that is ahead of us, which is that of the 2019 European elections. Uh, we know that until today, European elections have been mostly used to uh, perform a kind of uh, big survey of how national parties are doing and how well the government is polling uh, and have not been used for a genuine transnational alternative being presented to citizens of Europe all across the continent. Uh, part of the reason for this has been, uh, we think, the lack of genuine transnational political forces, parties, confluencias, as you want to call them, that can bring a pan-European program, a pan-European mobilization to the peoples of Europe from Portugal to Poland. And this is something that we hope we can try and foster by the next electoral appointment. Something we have seen uh, with European Alternatives uh, over the last 10 years, uh, this is the year when European Alternatives turns 10, it's also the year when the financial crisis turns 10. And what we have seen in those 10 years can really be summed up, if you like, as the story of the two Europes. Uh, on the one hand, the Europe of the institutions, the Europe of bureaucracy, the Europe of the political establishment that says, no, you can't. You cannot change things, there are no alternatives to this bankrupt uh, system, to this rigged democracy, to this rigged economy. 
And on the other side, you've seen a Europe uh, with an extraordinarily hidden vitality, a Europe of citizens, of social movements, of uh, grassroots, grassroots forces that mobilizes in Poland as much as here in Spain to say that refugees are welcome, that mobilizes in Germany, in Frankfurt, as much as in Naples, in Italy, to say that another economic system, another approach to labor, for instance, is possible, and more generally, a Europe that exists in the grassroots that thinks that democracy, justice, solidarity are not just empty words, but a genuine vision and a genuine possibility for our continent. And so what I'd like to see, Miguel, in 2019 is a political force that gives a political expression to this other Europe that already exists on the ground. Something that we might call a pan-European political party that is able not so much to run a few candidates and get a few people in the parliament of Brussels with all the limitations that it has, but that is able to hack the appointment of the European elections and parentheses, even the Zapatistas now are running for elections in Mexico, that is able to hack the appointment of the European elections to create a gigantic citizens-led, bottom-up, grassroots political mobilization, a Bernie Sanders moment in the greatest aspirations uh, for the whole European continent, a moment of politicization, enfranchisement, and alternatives. But for that, I think, uh, this is the provocation that I launched to you, Miguel, uh, we need uh, an upgrade of our political party. We cannot go on with European umbrella groups that are composed of national parties that disagree on the basics of what an alternative vision for Europe should be uh, constituted of, that disagree on what to do with the Euro. We need something that is much more ambitious than that, that has a common plan, a common program for the European level and a common campaign which begins from the citizens and perhaps brings the citizens to Brussels and doesn't just use these European elections as an internal midterm survey or as the chance to get a few MEPs and a, and a little bit of the money that comes with it. And so this is the provocation that I launched to you as uh, one of the founders of a party that uh, has the ambition and the vision that we need also in Europe today. Bueno, lo primero. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. To me, it's such a, such a pleasure. It's going to be a brief uh, conversation. We are waiting for the wine and some uh, food, uh, but the issue is uh, large enough uh, not to be resolved in 20 minutes. Maybe it would take more than a day just for this question. But just to focus on the debate, we must take into account the European level, but also the national level. This is very important for us, because in Spain, we speak too little of Europe. This is a, I don't think it's a south-north issue. For instance, in Italy, Europe has a larger centrality than in Spanish political debates. Most of the uh, correspondents of the Embryos uh, in Brussels, they say that, why do you speak so little of Europe in national campaigns? For instance, in, in Germany, one of the central debates of the link at Congress was the discussion about uh, the Europe that would never happen in Podemos. But not because of Podemos, it's because the way the political debate is, has been built in Spain and in Europe. And I think this is a, a terrible mistake because what is happening in Europe it has a strongest influence of what's happening here. And if we speak of the local level, the uh, uh, the Spanish, uh, the, the Madrid finances have been uh, controlled by Europe because of the fiscal compact. We are paying, uh, we are submitted to the Montoro law, Montoro bill, that applies this uh, fiscal compact to Spain. So we can't speak of uh, democracy at the municipal level if we don't take into account that there are institutional uh, organizations that are uh, obstructing the fact that in this district, 
two more schools uh, can be built because uh, even though there are the money is there, but we can't uh, spend it for that. When you go to Naples, uh, the magistrates uh, would tell you the same thing. They have the same problems. This fiscal compact, this uh, fiscal ceiling, that avoids any uh, social spending. And that comes from Europe. That could be an issue. Uh, that is fundamental because uh, now we have different horizons facing us to those horizons we must answer at the European elections. I am more worried about answering certain questions rather than having a very well fit program for that election because, because we are not going to be able to meet those promises. It is not possible to meet any program, electoral program from the uh, European Parliament. It is possible to answer some questions because the European Parliament that is uh, going to be elected in next election is the power, most powerless institution in the whole Europe. So we just can answer some questions from there. One of this question is, which is our alternative to Europe? Which is our current alternative, what is happening in Europe? I think that currently, to remain in the European Union as it is, means managing austerity, means uh, managing neoliberalism, and means basically managing cuts. No other option is available within the frame of the European Union. And so everything is well tied, and for Spanish this uh, phrase uh, is well known because Franco said it. Everything is well tied. From Maastricht on, uh, they have uh, abstracted. Greece is uh, an example, a paradigm of the little capacity that the nation state has in the, in the frame of the European Union to oppose austerity policies. Weber himself, the speaker of the popular party of the European Parliament, when the Greek uh, debate ended, the, he said, the example of Greece is a good example that in Europe a left government is not possible in the European Union. Please take heed, Greece, take heed. Spain, take it, Podemos, just after the OHI referendum and the application of the memorandum and the coup d'etat against Syriza. And I think he's right. Uh, a left government is not possible at the European Union, but the alternative that uh, is being offered to us is the identity uh, retreat the national retreat, the retreat towards nation-state, hegemonized by the far left, far right. And from Ochi to Brexit, we must have an interesting reading of why first we had Ochi and then Brexit. What happened in between? If we don't want to manage austerity and we don't want uh, an identitary retreat either, we must propose a third way of the construction of a European project, which is not the same uh, as speaking of the European Union, and that European project must be built on the basis of disobedience to the European treaties. I think that Perry Anderson said in an article for Le Monde Diplomatique, very interesting in March, about anti-systemic anti movements in Europe, where he would say that any uh, movement or anti-systemic movement, if we don't want, if you don't want to speak of left, First, uh, to want to do something, uh, to, who wants to do something in Europe, is to end with Maastricht. A consensus for a European proposal would be to propose the disobedience to the treaties and to, and to propose that that begins 
disobeying from Maastricht Gong. And we can do that at the European elections, of course, with a transnational project, with a transnational proposal, but also from the municipalities. We shouldn't wait for the European elections. We must break with uh, this uh, blackmail of austerity, this blackmail of the uh, uh, intervention of this uh, scissor of uh, seizing of the fiscal uh, administration of the municipalities must be the opposition to that must be coordinated, and through that coordination we can build an alternative European project. It's disobedience as a way of uh, creating a path by walking it. And uh, municipalities must uh, visualize that alternative that should go beyond the elections and beyond political parties. And here, social movements have a key role and a voice and a word beyond opinions uh, in electoral programs. I think it's necessary to answer that question, which is our alternative to neoliberal Europe, our alternative to the identitary retreat proposed by the European Le Pen's that question can be answered uh, at the European elections. Net next uh, answer is uh, how far are we able to Europeanize a debate, a political debate that allows for a subject uh, with something in common to be built. Uh, because in, uh, at the the European Union has no subject, it's just a coordination of subjects, and the only thing that would be offered is a certain welfare state, certain freedoms, that would, that would be the offer. Uh, of the European Union to the southern peoples. That construction of a subject, how can we give a response to that construction of a subject, the fact that a Polish citizen can have a relationship with a Greek citizen, with a Portuguese, with a German citizen? How do we build, build that relationship among uh, different people? Peoples. Let me pick up on a couple of points that, that you've made. Um, I think citizens are ahead of political forces in answering this question. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember a few years ago in a Blockupy protest in Frankfurt, yep. uh, a beautiful exchange between a Greek activist and a German activist. And the German, Marcus, uh, said to the Greek, Christos, it is terrible what our government is doing in Greece, you have all our solidarity, we are absolutely uh, in solidarity with you. And Christus responded, well, you know, fuck off, we don't need your charity. What we need you is to fight together with us, because your mini-jobs, your precarious unemployment, the fact that Germany might be the, the richest country of Europe, but it's also the country with the largest percentage of working poor, means that there is a lot of common... Mejor this, better this. There is a, a, a lot of uh, common uh, necessity to struggle together, to work together. And this working together beyond borders, I think at the level of civil society, at the level of social movements, we have seen it uh, being much more progressed than political party representation in Brussels has actually uh, achieved it. Um, I take a slightly different um, uh, lesson from the, the Greek uh, crisis of 2015, which I totally agree was uh, a watershed moment. It was the moment when many of us lost the hope that uh, this Europe could be transformed into something human and, and based on justice and on, and on democracy. But what we saw there was um, a double lack. On the one hand, we saw the lack of uh, transnational counterpower that could actually mobilize civil society, could actually mobilize citizens in a wave of indignation for what was happening in Athens and in Brussels over those months. We haven't seen the squares of Madrid filling with the same indignation uh, that they utilized back in 2011. We haven't seen the squares uh, of Rome. We haven't seen German trade unions declaring a one hour of support strike with the crashing of the rights
rights of workers in Greece. And so we see the lack of a transnational um, coordination, a transnational mobilization that can actually construct a counterpower to the, to the Europe that comes from the top down. But the second lesson that I've taken is that the Europe that comes from the top down is not a monolithic entity. It is not Europe. It is a union of national states, of national governments. Uh, what uh, the people that were putting Tsipras in a corner in the council, in the Eurogroup in July 2015 was not some ghost of Europe. It was the prime ministers of the Eurozone countries, including the socialist prime minister of France and the supposedly center-left prime minister of Italy at the time, Matteo Renzi. The same socialist forces that then would go to complain about austerity measures without having had the guts to raise one finger when Tsipras was being waterboarded and they actually were given the chance of transforming the fight of Syriza into a pan-European demand for a different economic policy. And so what we probably need to do is to work um, on a continuum to understand that there is no difference between national politics, local politics, European politics, but that there is only politics, which is what happens to you, and it happens to you in an interdependent continuum that goes from the global to the very local. We need pan-European forces, we need pan-European counterpowers, we need local authorities, national governments that disobey, absolutely. This is also how you transform, uh, you transform Europe. The two things go hand in hand. If we are unable to construct a European mobilization, uh, we're also going to have difficulty in Europeanizing national politics, in explaining to the members and the voters of Podemos, for instance, why what Podemos does in Europe is actually extraordinarily important for what happens in their lives here in Spain or in Barcelona or in Madrid. And the final point, which maybe leads us also to the question about Catalonia, is the uh, uh, interconnectedness. We see a kind of constant process of uh, retrenchment, of renationalization over the last years. Um, the slogan, we want to take back control, it's quite an important slogan, not only in Brexit Britain. There is a sense that we have very little political agency over the politics that happens over our heads at the global level or at the European level. And the response that is given is to fold back onto the nation state, to retreat behind national borders. But then we discover that also those national countries, those nation states, are actually places where democracy isn't particularly de developed, are places that are authoritarian, top-down, that relegate the possibility of an alternative to one side of the political spectrum. And then sometimes you have a demand of going on to a smaller scale nation state, be it in Catalonia, be it in Scotland, be it in Flanders. Maybe smaller, we can take back control that even at the national level we think we're losing. And then the process continues and continues and continues in, with the belief that the smaller, the easier to control. But we need to, I think, subvert this dynamic and we need to raise a point that, that you made and that it is important to underline that there is a constant process of interdependence. Uh, whatever happens globally, global neoliberalism, globalization, or at European level, limits the chances of a national political agency to express itself, which limits the possibility of a region or a municipality to have an alternative policy. There is the fiscal compact in the EU. We have the same fiscal compact at national level in Italy that, as you were reminding, blocks the possibility of the mayor of Naples of implementing alternative policies. And so I think we need to uh, upgrade our understanding of political struggle and to understand that we are in a context where there is no borders anymore between the forces that constrain us. And if we want to take back control, what we need to be able to develop is a capacity of doing coordinated political action in Barcelona, in uh, our region, in our states, at the European level, and indeed beyond the European level. And that's the kind of party I would like to see developing, something that brings all those different levels uh, together in 2019. Maybe to have a question uh, for you, I, I, I would like to understand to what extent um, the current debate of political parties in the European Parliament is addressing the, the demand for renewal of the political offer at European level. To what extent we can expect uh, a new conception of politics by existing political parties, if we can expect it at all, uh, in, in, in 2019? Este. Este que 
about Lorenzo's words, I, of course, the European Union is a coordination of countries, but commanding is only one. Uh, the power of Germany over the European Union is terrible, brutal. Very simple thing, the European Commission, there are only two uh, chiefs of, uh, of uh, the commissioners that are not uh, German, one Italian and one French. The Germanization of the European Esto Union is uh, un Alemania, brutal. No? This is si this Alemania, a problem of Germany. No, the great success of Merkel un, un has been to build de uh, a, claro que sí. a country claro que sí. of millionaires Pero with millions of people. But when the European Union is expecting about what X. is going to happen with the uh, German elections in order to decide which policies uh, are they going to adopt. This uh, says everything about what's going in Germany. When Dijsselbloem spoke about the southern countries, he was saying that in Germany to a German newspaper for a German audience. We must think also what has happened in Germany, where, in, uh, to a certain extent, the German politics uh, has become European. For the first time, a far-right party has entered the Bundestag. Only country left, uh, only exceptions are Portugal and Spain. We have far-right uh, MPs, uh, but not uh, far-right uh, party at the parliament. We still have that exception, but not Germany anymore. So, uh, so the German politics is always more Europeanized. But I, f I think it's important to hide like that. It's not a minor issue, the way the European architecture is built. The fiscal compact, they want to profit from Brexit in order to institutionalize the fiscal compact. That would make it possible to renegotiate the, uh, the deficit ceiling. We must uh, pay attention which direction these proposals are taking. Uh, the proposals John Juncker made at the last uh, State of the Union session. He spoke of institutionalizing the Eurogroup, the fiscal compact, if we and the European integration through the army, through common security and the construction of an economic pact and the activation of the weapons industry. So where are we heading to? We are heading to a, the no return is always stronger. This is important to understand and also that resistance in the, uh, throughout Europe are not, are not really flourishing against this. So it's very worrying the fact that in the East uh, Germany, the Linke has lost uh, some 400,000 votes going to AfD. In Austria, we have a far-right government with a far radical right government that 10 years ago about sanctions, diplomatic sanctions by the European Union and now has become normal, it's become normalized. So, let's see the general involution, authoritarian involution, in which we have the Polish example, we have the Orban example in Hungary, the elections in the Czech Republic, but although the Pirate Party has had uh, uh, good results, but the winner is an eccentric far-right millionaire. So let's situate where the European Union is heading to. 
And sobre eso, sobre lo que, on that sobre lo basis, que we must uh, act. And the European Union is uh, uh, going through an authoritarian turning point in which uh, the events in Catalonia are, an, are part of that authoritarian turning point. The application of the 155 the constitutional article uh, in Spain hasn't generated in, in any surprise in Europe. It's been sort of normalized. They have only asked uh, for uh, mild violence to be uh, exerted. Donald Tusk uh, said to Rajoy, please don't hit them too hard when you apply this article. But I think that 14, 15 years ago wouldn't, couldn't happen this way. The uh, seven, Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty could, be, or could have been applied in the case of the 1st of October because of the disproportionate uh, uh, um, operation of the Spanish police. So different uh, parliamentary groups said that, but who is going to uh, do this in the European Commission? So we are going through this um, authoritarian turning point, the emergence of the far right is just another aspect of it, and against this we must answer with a project with local roots, if we don't want to speak of nations, strong roots in the territory, but overcoming this territorial or local through the coordination for a project for Europe. But that project for Europe, since there is no European subject, can't help being the sum of different components and the result of an agreement uh, among that sum. For 2019, there is no other option than a sum, the most uh, uh, virtuous possible. Uh, some not of uh, labels or names of parties, but of proposals generating a common project. That would be the most interesting. While well, you all want to go to lunch or take a wine, uh, you're looking me badly, but I don't know if we still have some more time. We're closing, okay, wrapping up. <laughs> Daphne is looking angry at me. Okay, I, I wasn't looking bad at you. I no, <laughs> but, um, but, I, but I had the feeling that people were looking maybe bad at my back. So, um, but no, so I think the translators have to leave so we can continue this conversation, but I think then half of the people in the room don't understand us anymore. So um, let me first of all thank uh, the translators and thank you for staying longer. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you. Maybe just one more. I have one more thing to say. So before you, before you all stand up. So um, yeah, thank you very much, all of you, for for being here with us. And I and I and I want to thank uh, really most of all all those who made this this festival possible. If you were here on the first night on Wednesday, you've seen the the group of people who were here. I think uh, many of them are doing currently things, so they can't come back up. But uh, really, thank you so much to the team uh, who made Trans Europa Festival possible. I think you know who you are, and uh, give them a big applause, please.